so excited. I love to preach to a full house. And when I preach, I love for you to say amen. Hey. Woo! Oh, man. <laughs> Hey, listen, you know, we got some rocks left, and it's a 52-day miracle, and we're down to 28 days. Yeah. When I drove around and saw that sign, it just made me go, oh. But listen, what you do is you take this rock to carry with you, and you take this rock, and you put it in outside, and you take a picture of yourself, put it in the rock, write your favorite verse or one of the verses out of the 52-day devotion, and you text it to 640-1273, 640-1273. Twelve seventy-three. So after church today, I've got all these extra rocks. Amen? Amen. So at the end of the service, y'all come get a little rock. You come get a big rock. And at the end of the service, when you go home today, you stop by and you take a picture and you send it to six four zero twelve seventy-three. Amen. Man, there's some other exciting things happening today. Hey, hey, come here, Richie. Richie, Richie. He he he's the new associate pastor, focusing in on small groups and journey groups. And everybody said. Hey. Yeah, you're really not li you're really not liked as much as they say, <laughs> but they make you feel good, amen. Good. And if you're not in a small group and you may would like to talk about one at the end of the service, he'll be in the back. And I think at 12:30 you have a lunch, and if you want to come back at 12:30, you can have lunch with him, amen. amen. And I'm gonna have lunch with him, man. I really like to st him stand here. He makes me feel good looking. Go ahead. <laughs> and, and then my daughter, hey, hey, she gets her looks from her dad. But anyway, if, if you notice, they have a children's camp. And what I did notice, Kayla, in here where they said that it was $230 per student. But if I understand it correctly, if they'll come to the meeting, whenever that is, next week. <laughs> I knew that. I just want to make sure you did. If you come to the meeting, ne meeting next week, you can learn how your child can raise most of the money. You got any questions? Go. They can raise all the money. You can raise all the money. So if you have any questions, y'all talk to Kayla. Okay, let's hear it. Woo! I'm so excited about Nehemiah, and Nehemiah, God used in such a great way. And today, I found out one of the keys to Nehemiah's success. As a matter of fact, if you would learn the two simple keys to Nehemiah's success, it'll not only be, help you be successful with God, it'll be, help you be more successful with your mate. And it'll be more, help you be more successful on your job. And those two keys are your attitude and action. And so it's really cool when I thought that's really thing. I said, listen, I, I, I sent the secretary and Joshua a message today or yesterday. I said, man, I want everybody to get one of these. I don't know if you got one, but it's called an attitude test. And if you don't, get one at the end. Now, at this time, I hadn't taken it. <laughs> but since I knew I was preaching on it, I thought I was going to do pretty good. And so I take the test that I added up this morning. The answer is, in your daily prayer life, you need to make this a matter of prayer that your attitude will be upgraded. <laughs> but anyway, I, I want to work on my attitude, and I want you to work on your attitude because I'm telling you, your attitude and your actions greatly determine your destiny. See, and what I want you to know is in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, I'm going to go ahead and read them because then I'm going to refer to them. There's some things I want you to know that grace and love is always given by God. But trust and favor is often earned. See, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, it said, It came to pass in the month of Nisal, and the twelfth year of King Xerxes, when the wine was before him. Now, I don't think it was just the wine that had him make this decision, because he had just started drinking. But it was before, and, and he took the wine, Nehemiah did, and he gave it to the king. Now, he had never been sad in his presence before. Wouldn't that be something for you to be said, your kids say about you, or you say, he had such a great attitude when he came before the king, he had never seen him sad. Wouldn't it be something if you said, man, how's your kids? Man, they are always have a good attitude. Wouldn't it be great if you ask your mate? And they said, man, my husband always has a great attitude. And men, wouldn't it be even more wonderful if you said, my wife always has a great attitude all during the month. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> Therefore, let's get on to the subject. <laughs> Therefore, the king, he said to me, Nehemiah, why? Why is your face sad? I hope I can get to this. And you can understand the importance of why. The way that you answer the why question will greatly determine 
the decisions that are made to the question. Why might be one of the most important questions you learn to answer before you're asked than anything I know. It's so overlooked, but you'll see later on that, that the king, later on, he asked him what he could do for him because of the why. Why, why is your face sad since you're not sick? That This is nothing more but sorrow of the heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Wait, do you understand when you came before this king, if you were sad, if he wanted to, he'd just have you killed. That's one reason to have a good attitude, amen? <laughs> but that's not the only reason. He, Nehemiah just had a good attitude, and his attitude and his action greatly determined his destiny in life. And he said to the king, uh, may the king live forever. Smart move. Anytime your boss asks you what's going on, you say, man, you're the greatest boss in the world. Then you go tell him what you want. <laughs> then he says, why? Here it is. Why should my face not be sad? See, he said, why? And the answer to the question and the blessings in favor of God will greatly determine your answer to why. And it's the same thing in your marriage. It's the same thing in your job. It's the same thing in church. He said, why should my face not be sad? Why should I not want to take on this particular task? Why should I not want to go there? Why should I? What is the answer to the why? Then he said, then the city and the place where my father tombs lies in waste, and its gates are burned with fire. See, Nehemiah had the great answer to the why question. And the king said to him, what do you request? My goodness gracious, do you understand? Here's this king, the most powerful person in the world. And Nehemiah learned to answer the why the right way. And the king says, he looks at Nehemiah, and he said, what is your request? And then he said, I pray to the God of heaven. In other words, Nehemiah said, man, this is a critical point. Sometimes instant prayers are the most powerful prayer. But what I want you to know today, if you were here and God stepped in and God came up here and he asked Journey Church, he said, what is your request? Could you even answer it? More than that, can I ask you, what is the greatest request that you would have from God today? If God said, I want you to have the favor of God and the favor of God is when God takes the natural and does the supernatural in a place or a purpose or a person's life for the very purpose of bringing honor and glory to God. The, the favor of God is when you're assured of God's presence, his provisions, and his power to accomplish his purpose in and through your life. It's the greatest thing that anybody ever experienced in his life. And can I tell you, God has a purpose for your life. See, a Nehemiah, though, I want you to know, had a non-Christian boss, a non-Christian king, just like many of you do. Or maybe you work for one that doesn't act like one, and if that's me, don't say anything. But, but that, that's just it. This is why this message is so, so important. Because most of, you ready? Most of our problems and most of our pressures come from two areas. Our job and our home. Yeah. See, we spend so much of our time on our job and so much time in our home until we understand how to get the favor with God and those in our home will never really be happy. And see, a Nehemiah learned the key to this, and God wants you to have his favor on your job and in your home and in your church and in your school. Let me give you some insights that may not be in your bulletin. First of all, this king did not finance and provide protection to rebuild the wall because he cared about Nehemiah's purpose or his plan or his people. I never realized that. This is my second time to go through Nehemiah verse by verse. And I always focused on Nehemiah and God's hand on Nehemiah, and that is true. But when Nehemiah asked the king for the provisions, the finance, and the protection to rebuild the walls, let me tell you, Nehemiah, I mean, Nehemiah's boss, his king, could care less about what Nehemiah was doing, where he was going, or even about his people. The truth is King Xerxes may have been part of the reason that the walls were turned down. Here's the insight. You ready? Many times people need to believe in you before they believe in Jesus. See, they believed in Nehemiah, the king did, before he believed in Nehemiah's project. He believed in Nehemiah before he believed in Nehemiah's uh, God. Does, do, when people see you, do they believe in you where they'll come to the point they'll believe in your God? Ooh, Brother James. That was good. And, and see, on the other hand, you might be here. You might be here today, and you're with a friend that you believe in, and it's my prayer today you'll believe in their God. 
Can I tell you something people don't understand? See, people follow people first, not programs. People follow people first, not denominations. People follow people first, and then I hope those people that they're following lead them to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Point number two. Love and grace is given from God, but trust and favor is often earned. See, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. But grace and favor is often earned. Nehemiah honored the king. He obeyed the king, but he loved the king of kings. See, you can go to work, and you can work for a non-believer. You can still honor him. You can still obey him. Just remember your ultimate loyalty is to the king of kings. Fourth, if trust and favor comes, <clears throat> trust and favor comes over time, it's best displayed when nobody's watching. In other words, I, I don't believe Nehemiah was trustworthy and hardworking, had a positive attitude just when the king was watching him. I think he was just as positive, just a hard worker when nobody was watching him, and that's why he ended up having the trust and favor of God. Amen. Fifth, this is so important. I believe this same principle applies on your job, in your family, in your church, in your school, in your home. Yep. See, we should love everybody, amen? 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 We don't care what they did. We don't know where they came from. We don't know what you did this weekend. But when you walk in Journey Church, we love you. Amen? Amen. But to really trust that person, have the favor with that person, it takes time to earn that trust and favor. It's just like this. God loves everybody. Amen? Amen. Amen. Nothing you can do to earn it. Nothing you can do to get rid of it. But he doesn't trust us all the same. Because some of us has misused what God's given us. We, 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 we should love all our family the same, amen? We should love all our kids the same. <laughs> but you can't treat them all the same. I know, you're saying, oh no, my kids have already told me that. <laughs> my kids have said, well, you just did for Sister Sue and you didn't do for Billy Bob. And the truth is, we want to do for everyone on the same. But you can trust some at one level and another one at a different level. You can let some drive at 16 and you're crazy to let some drive at 17. Amen? Amen? So see, you love them all. The kids get it confused because they get confused. They get love and trust confused together. Yep. See, I, I, I've got some kids or some grandkids, man, they ask me to go. I say, man, just rock and roll. i got some. I say, oh, no, please, Jesus. <laughs> so do you. Amen. Same thing in marriage. You always love your mate. But the longer you're together, you should trust each other more. And they should have your favor. When my wife asks if she can go somewhere, it's never because whether I trust her or don't trust her. It's just because I want her home with me. But <laughs> yeah, if she's not there very often, I start calling when you're coming home. I'm worse than a kid. But I have the trust and favor. She does. If I want to go somewhere and do something, she, her, her first question is, ha ha, can I trust you? Now, sometimes, you know, but it's not that. It's where you going when you're coming home. Did you know that Nehemiah's boss, the king, if you would read the second chapter of Nehemiah when you really comes down to it, when Nehemiah told him the why, and then when the king said what, Nehemiah told him all this. He said, man, I need a lot of provisions. I need a lot of money, and I need a lot of protection. Listen to this. Jonathan the king said, when are you coming back? He trusted where he was going, but he wanted to know when he was coming back. Do the people in your life, do they want you to come back, or are they just glad you're gone? <laughs> when you go to your boss and you say, man, I need to take off, and he says, okay, when are you coming back? Because when you go on the job and he doesn't care when you come back, you better, when you're off, you better be looking for a job. But you see how important it is that we have the favor and trust of our family and the favor and trust of God. And it is earned that love is given. And you need to understand that is true on your job and in your home and in your school and every single area in your life. So many of you that you're calling is not fair and you're blaming other problems. You're really the problem. Amen. Nehemiah 2.1, it says it like this. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, 
in the twelfth year of the king of Xerxes, when the wine was before him, he looked, he took the wine, he gave it to the king. Now he said, never been sad in his presence before. Principle number one that you really need to write down, you need to learn is your day-to-day attitude and actions will greatly determine your destiny. You you can write everything else down today, but I want you to learn one thing, that your day-to-day actions and attitude will greatly determine your destiny, of course with God, but in your marriage. Your day-to-day actions and your attitude will greatly determine your success in marriage. The problem with this, most people that have a bad attitude don't even know they got a bad attitude. If you want to really know, ask your mate, but most of them will lie. And then they'll just go in the room and ask forgiveness. Ask your kids, they'll tell the truth. Ask your closest friend, take this test like me. I thought, hey, precious Jesus, I know I'm preaching on attitude. I'm going to pull the test out. I'm going to take it. I thought I was going to ace it. I've never made an A in my life. I thought, this is the time. No, still don't. I I actually was going to cheat, but then I thought that'd be a bad attitude. I mean, you just can't win. If you're really brave, you take the test. And before you write on it, shoot several copies. Let your mate take it for you, and you take it for your mate. And if you don't end up in a divorce, (laughs) don't do that, baby. (laughs) Uh, When I say attitude, though, there's some people that just seem like they're just happy and bubbly all the time. Praise God for those people. Sometimes I want to kill them, but, but it's okay. If that's really you, that's great. But that's not really simply all I'm talking about. I'm talking about those people that grow and they mature and they begin to learn to master their mood. Master your mood, Brother James. You've actually begun to meddle. Amen? I mean, do do you understand what EQ is versus IQ? And EQ helps you uh, uh, raise your uh, uh, level of emotional intellect where you can handle pressure more. See, some people say, well, my mom was just like that. You can't treat a new dog, new trick. You're not a dog. And it's not a trick. It's the gospel. And as you mature, I don't ever totally manage my moods. Amen. I wish I did, but I don't. But brother, compared to what I used to, you think I'm a saint because I am. (laughs) Master me. Second of all, do you have a really an attitude of gratitude? I mean, overall, are you so thankful what God has given you instead of always focus on what you don't have? I mean, every good and perfect gift that you have in your life, including your health, your family, your job, every single thing that's good in your life came from God. So many people have so much good, and yet they focus on so much bad. So let me tell you, when I'm talking about having the right attitude, I'm talking about learning to master your moods. I'm talking about beginning to develop an attitude of gratitude, being thankful for all that God has given you. You say, Brother James, you can't be thankful for everything. Absolutely. I may not be thankful it happened to me, but I'm thankful that I serve a God that can turn it around for the good. Amen? Amen. So it's that kind of God. So you master your moods. You have an attitude of gratitude. And then you have a great faith that God is in control And the outcome as well. Not only is God in control of your day-to-day process, your life, your marriage, your your job, but God is in control even when things look bad. He's still in control of the outcome. Because, see, if you don't believe that and you don't learn that and you don't change your attitude, you're going to be up and down with your attitude because you're going to have bad days and good days. But, see, ultimately God's in control of the outcome. Either he is or he isn't. Amen? So learn the real truth about the crap that comes into your life. Hey, man, I'm going to give you all one of these pretty soon. I had me a thousand printed up. And on this side, I, I just used it several times. It says crap. <laughs> and, and somebody called me this week and they said, I meant all oh, crap happened in my life. And they were crying. They were hysterical. I said, fantastic. <laughs> I won't tell you what they said, but anyway. <laughs> I said, crap means Christ is going to reverse another problem in your life. They went from crying to laughing. Amen. You you want one of these cards? Come back next Sunday, you get one. (laughs) But bring it on, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Let me me give you some insights about attitude. We got to rock. We had not even got to point one. (laughs) We may not either. Point number one. What most people call problems... 
people with a positive attitude often call opportunity. Man, it is so important how you see the problems and pressures that come into your life. I honestly believe that most people miss the opportunity God gives them because they're so focused on the problems and pressures that come their way that many times God's just allowing those problems and those pressures where you can push through those things where you find out the opportunity that God has for your life. Amen. So here's the question. What problems could you be facing today that are really nothing more than God wanting to turn them around and be the greatest opportunity that you've ever had in your life. So one is that. Second of all, second of all, people with positive attitude, man, they, they'll attempt things that nobody else will. They'll attempt things that nobody else will do. Nehemiah was attempting to go to his non-believing boss and being sad, which he didn't get killed, and then not only asking him why, then he said, hey, man, would you give me this money? Would you give me this protection? Would you give me these provisions? I mean, Nehemiah was willing to attempt things that nobody else was. David in the Bible, he was willing to attempt things that nobody else was. Journey Church, you can attempt things that nobody else will if you'll change your attitude and change your actions. Amen? Amen. Listen, people with a positive attitude, this is real important. I'll come back to it. They make decisions based on who God is, not what God's doing. See, if you start making decisions just based on what's going on in your life, you'll never make the right decision. But if you start basing your decision on who God is instead of what's going on, when Nehemiah was asking these requests, when Nehemiah was fixing to ask the biggest question ever in life, listen, Nehemiah was a slave. His people were in bondage. They were living a discouraged, defeated life. And yet Nehemiah was fixing to ask his non-believing boss the biggest request he ever had in his life. Not because of who his boss was, because who his God was. Amen. That's worth saying amen. amen. I said, that's worth saying amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Moses. Okay. So remember, the children of Israel were living in disgrace that's not who they were. That's where they were living. This is so important. You ready? I don't care what sins you've committed in the past. I, I don't care what sin you committed before you came in here. Now, God does. I don't. <laughs> I don't care what lifestyle you've lived in the past. If you're a Christian, that's not who you are. That's what you did. You say, how can that be, Brother James? Oh, yeah, yeah. The prodigal son, was he still the son of the father? Amen. When he went back, did his father say, hey, you sorry son of a gun. You're not my son anymore. No, he, he came back. He said, man, kill the fatted calf, put the ring, put a robe. Let's have a party. Amen. So, see, he was still the son. And so it's not what you do makes you who you are. If you're a child of the king, you're a child of the king no matter what you do, no matter where you go. That's what you did. That's not who you are. People with a positive attitude, they make their decisions based on how, are y'all ready? How things could be, not as they are. Man, you want to radically change your life, Journey Church? You start making decisions based on who God is and what it could be like, not what it is. And let, let, let me give you three things to remember again because I'm starting to run out of time. And we had not even got the first point, so I better review your problem can really be an opportunity. You say, Brother Jay, well, how can conflict be an opportunity? Do you understand if you learn to handle conflict correctly, and if your mate will receive the handling of the conflict correctly, that conflict really leads to the greatest intimacy that you'll ever have? You can't have intimacy with God. You can't have intimacy with your mate. You can't have intimacy with your kids without conflict. Yep. Amen, Brother James. Y'all don't have to say that. I can say it. I've learned a long time ago how to amen me. <laughs> Second of all, make decisions based on who God is, not what God's doing. What is it in your life that you need to start making the decisions based on God, who God is, not what's going on in your life? And then when some, uh, make decisions on how things could be, not as they are. See, you, you, need, so you need to leave today, not someday, today. And you start making decisions based on how they could be, not as they are. So what do you mean, Brother James? I mean, some of you are really struggling in your marriage, and I don't care if you got a good marriage. What if you start living like what it could be, not what it is? I mean, it's good. It could be better. I'm going to tell you, I went, why give up good for the best? And so, so you just start living. Man, you come home. Man, I got the greatest wife in the world, which I do. And 
I just start living like that and I start speaking words like that. And man, before long, I start believing that. And then it's true. Start, start, start living your marriage, speaking words, making decisions based on what it could be, not what it is. Did you know you go to your job? Where do you have most of your problems? On your home and on job? Go to your job. Go to your job Monday, and you just start living like it's the best job in the world, like it could be. You start speaking words out loud like it could be. See, that's what I'm telling you. When you start living, you start acting, you start speaking like it could be, it might just be. How about, how about at school? Kids are in school. How about church? How about your home? See, we have our attitudes and actions will greatly determine the destiny that we have in life. See, people with a positive attitude... They began to attract and influence people that it can go further, faster than they ever dreamed they could. And our church is an example of that. Our church is growing faster. It's going further than we ever dreamed or we ever believed that would ever happen. See, Nehemiah's attitude, he had never been sad before the king. And yet, he not only, you ready? He not only was able to influence the king, but he was willing to rally a troop of people that so believed in his God, that was their God, that came back and served together to serve the God that they did more in 52 days than they were able to do in a whole generation prior to that. See, I believe God wants to work in your life and my life the exact same way. And in verse 2, it kind of sums it up. He said, therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad since you're not sick? Why is your heart sorrow because of this? you got to understand how to answer the whys in your life. But if you, if you, you were going to do one thing today, I would ask you a question. How are you influencing other people to want the God that you have? Most people are going to have to believe in you before they believe in your God. When you go to work tomorrow, when you go to school, wherever you're going tomorrow, would you live a life to try to influence other people to want your God? Would you have an action and an attitude that's different than everybody else's on the job? But see, even though Nehemiah went to work every single day and he worked for a non-believer because of his attitude and action, he was able to influence him in a supernatural way. Do, do you need to come and ask God to help you have the right attitude and the right actions? Some of you want to give the invitation in a minute. You say, hey, God, help me learn to master my moods. And you just know the truth is you're just a moody person. When your kids, your family, and your loved ones come around, they're, they're, they, you know, they almost want to check your mood before they speak. And we laugh about it. We make fun about it. That's not true. See, God says he wants you to have an attitude as he had. He was patient. He was loved. He was kind. And see, today, you may know that hadn't been you lately. And you've been blaming everybody else. Well, if the kids wouldn't have done that, if my wife said, if I wouldn't have that problem, it, it, it works. See, that's, no, 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 no. That's you. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you. And in just a minute, you need to say, God, help me. Help me with that area. Some of you are not very grateful. You don't have an attitude of gratitude. The truth is you just constantly complain. You constantly want you're not happy with what you have. You're not happy with your job. You're not happy with your preacher. You're not happy with your mate. You're not happy with your own kids. And you know that the Holy Spirit's speaking to you today. And he's saying, hey, i got to master my moods. I need to be more grateful for the things that God has given me. And third, i, I got to increase my faith. i got to believe that God's in control of everything in my life. And I'm also believing that God's in control of the outcome of everything into my life. See, some of y'all are going through some things right now that are really bothering you. And you just need to come and say, hey, God, I'm, I'm going to believe Romans 8, 28. All things worth good, then love the Lord and call it their purpose. And, and God's going to turn it around and make something good come out of it in spite of what you're doing. So today, as an act of obedience, you just need to come and you need to put it on the altar. Some of you need to ask God about the problem. You ready? The problem that you're going, God, how in the world could that be an opportunity? And, and you ask God for wisdom because you can see things as God sees them. Then you'll just see through them and you'll see the other side of them. 
Some, some need to be willing to come this morning and make decisions based on, uh, on who God is, not what's going on in your life. Some of you need to come this morning and make a commitment and a decision. God, I'm going to start living like life could be, not as it is. Man, I, I want you to stand. I want to pray with you and pray for you. And man, we, we ought to have lives that are radically changed today. And the most important decision you'll ever make in your life is do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you're sure you died, that you'd go to heaven. Listen, I don't believe you can change your attitude till you have the attitude of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's pray. God, I love you. I love our church. I love our people. I want a changed people, God. I want them to be able to petition you and have answers to prayers that beyond our imagination. I know that's what you want. For God, that those that don't know Jesus Christ today would be the day that they step out. For those that have been coming and visiting church, and today's the day they want to come and join this church. For those that have never been publicly baptized, today's the day that they come and say that. For those that came with an unbelievable problem, with the bad mood, with ungratefulness, today every single one of us would change our attitudes and change our actions where we could experience the power and blessings of God. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.